Amen. You can be seated. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles or your instrument of Scripture, whatever it is you're looking on the Word with. I want you to look in Psalms 107. The 107th Psalm is a tremendous Psalm. Talks about the redemption of the Lord. Talks about His faithfulness, His goodness, His mercy. And you know, the thing that I like so much about reading the 107th Psalm is this. You know, that redemption is not just for a bunch of perfect people that never got in trouble. I mean, throughout this entire psalm, people are getting themselves in a mess, and they're crying out to the Lord in their mess, and he delivers them out of their mess. Amen? So, you know, when I begin to look at this, I begin to see the goodness of God, not just when we get saved, but all throughout our life. He's always there for us. And the Lord began to teach me and deal with me about ministering on the reality of redemption. And here in Psalm 107, verse 1, he says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. The word redeemed there also means delivered. But notice here that he says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy and his goodness, one translation says, endures forever. I wonder if that means for today. I think forever means today, doesn't it? It means us, praise God. It means it's still there. It means God is still pouring out his mercy. God is still giving us his goodness, and God is still a good God. Amen? Hallelujah. Notice the attitude we're to have. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. See, you need to get a hold of how good God is. If you've lost your joy, if you've lost your thanksgiving, if you've lost your praise, if you've lost your celebration, you've forgotten how good the Lord is. Because once you begin to understand how good he is, it puts some thanksgiving in your heart. It'll, it'll fill your mouth with praise. Hallelujah. And so we need to find out how good he is. And notice that he says his mercy endures forever or to every generation. His mercy is being poured out. His goodness is being poured out. Praise God. Now, everything you find in the Bible that God does for us comes through his mercy. Mercy is his love and compassion activated. Hallelujah. For God so loved or had mercy upon the world that he sent his son that whoever would believe on him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. Amen. When Jesus was here on the earth, he was, the, he was God incarnate. He was uh, the expression of God to humanity. Everything you want to know about God, read it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus. Whatever Jesus did, that's God's will. However Jesus treated people, that's how God treats people because he was God incarnate. He was here expressing to us the very image of God. And notice when you see a lot of things going on with the Lord Jesus, the people would cry out, Lord, have mercy on me. Ever remember reading all that? And what would that do when they'd cry out for his mercy? He'd stop and do something good for them, wouldn't he? Amen? Because the Lord is full of mercy. He's good. He's gracious. He desires to do something good for us. Hallelujah. So, so we need to rejoice in him. Then he says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Notice that we're supposed to be praising the Lord, having a great attitude, an attitude of thanksgiving because of his goodness. And then, praise God, we're supposed to be talking our redemption. Amen. Now, the word redeemed, I looked it up. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I can read what Greek scholars say and Hebrew scholars say. Amen. But in the Hebrew, this word over here means to buy back a relative or to purchase. I like that. To redeem, or it means here to buy back a relative. It's one of the translations. See, under the old covenant, sometimes people get sold in slavery, and somebody would have to come and redeem them, maybe a near kinsman. You know, you read that in the, in the uh, book of Ruth and different things. But, you know, they'd have to redeem them or, or bring them back out. And so here the word redeem means to, to buy back a relative or to purchase. Now, I begin to look at that with that, uh, you know, type of, of definition to this, and I begin to say, to buy back a relative. We're supposed to give the Lord praise and glory for he is good and his mercy endures to every generation and let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Let, the, let those who has been bought back into the family who have been purchased from their mess ups say so. See, at one time the human race was in the family of God. But Adam sinned and sin separated from God. So God so loved us that he sent his son and his son came and bought back the family. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? He came and purchased us and bought us back out of sin and out of the slavery of sin and purchased our freedom so we could be presented back to God again. Woo, 
Woo, glory to God. That means Jesus is our near kinsman. Amen. That means we needed somebody that was one of us to come and set us free. You see, the only way a person could be set free is a near kinsman had to come and pay a, a redemption for them. Well, aren't you glad Jesus took upon himself not the form of angels, but the form of man and came in the likeness of man and came as the seed of Abraham and redeemed you and me back to God Almighty so he could present us as family. Amen? And here's what we're supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to be going around here grumping and complaining because of all the darkness of the world and all the problems going on. No, we're supposed to be talking like family. God's family. We're supposed to be talking like those who have been purchased of God. We're supposed to be talking our redemption, not our bondage. Are you listening to me? See, but here's the problem with most Christians. Number one, a lot of Christians don't know that God is good. That's true. They think God, you know, puts things on them and makes them sick and makes them disease. And God, you know, he knocks them down to make them humble. And, you know, God's up there sitting in heaven like some old, you know, mean-spirited old man, you know, is aggravated everybody, you know, and if you mess up, he's got a, a, a stick and he hits you in the head with it. And if he misses you, he's got a, you know, a board beside him. He just marks down your name, puts a mark by it so he can hit you twice as hard next time. No, that's not God. God is a good God. God is love. Amen. There's no hatred. There's no anger. There's nothing in God but good. There's nothing in God but mercy and love and kindness. And he's a good God. Hallelujah. And he's for us, not against us. And he so loved us that even while we were yet in our sins, when we couldn't get to him, God sent his son and redeemed us. And Romans says over there in the fifth chapter, it said that for some people, some people would even dare to think maybe I would give up something for them. But who would go to their enemy and give their son and let their son die on a cross to redeem their enemy that's what god did and jesus purchased us back and redeemed us what from the hand of the enemy the word hand there means power of the enemy the grip of the enemy jesus came and brought you out of the power of the enemy he delivered you from the stronghold of the enemy he delivered you from the hand you're not under the hand of the enemy anymore that means that the devil doesn't have a right to put a hand on you oh you didn't hear me Come on, folks. You and I need to walk along and say, don't put your hand on me. Are you hearing me? See, I was raised up with the John Wayne type of generation. I don't go messing with people, but I don't let people go messing with me. Amen? I won't put my hands on you, but you're certainly not going to put your hands on me. Now, when you get saved, what you got to do is you got to get hooked up with God because God says, listen, I'm going to put my hand on you and cast you out, but you ain't going to put no hand on me. Amen. And as a child of God, what you've got to do is understand that the devil no longer has a right to put his hands on you. Now, if he can't put his hand on you, that means he can't transfer from what he has to you. He can't put disease on you and make a stick because the Lord has redeemed you from it. Amen. Whatever he has in his hand, you have been delivered from. And Satan is a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. All he's got in his hands are things that kill, steal, and destroy. But he can't put that on you because the Lord has delivered you from it. Amen. And now what he is saying is you've got to get a revelation of your redemption because you can't talk what you don't know. Come on, you've got to get a hold of this. How can you talk what you don't know? How can you declare what you don't know? Huh? See, I was watching this movie, and it's a great movie. It's about a guy, and he was a ball player, and he hurt his arm, and then he went to his coaching. And, and that long story short, you know, he, he's a teacher, but then he gets his chance. He gets to play a couple years in the major league. It's a great story and, and, and stuff and, and for athletes and things. But, but you know, uh, it, it's amazing. He is a teacher. He's, ta- he's, he's teaching his class, and he has this kid, and he says, and if this question, and the kid says, uh, it means this. He said, don't answer it like it's a question. If you're going to answer it, answer it like you know it. And the trouble with us is this. If we aren't speaking like we know it, the devil understands that we're guessing. 
So what you've got to go to is the word and find out what you're redeemed from and what you're redeemed out of and what you're redeemed into and get it in your heart and say it with conviction. And when the devil comes and tries to put his hand on you, you've got the word of redemption to speak back to him and you've got something to fight with. Now you can look at him and say, you are not going to put that on me. You don't have a right to put your hands on me, Mr. Devil. No, sir. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom the Lord has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. He's your enemy. So I have a right to stand up against my enemy. Amen. Amen. So what are we redeemed from? First of all, let's go over here to Colossians chapter 1. Let's just take a few moments and find out what we're redeemed from so that we can start talking it. See, you're going to have to get the word in your mouth. Do you understand all redemption works through faith? And faith works through believing it and saying it. If you don't ever say it, it's never going to work in your life. Come on, Christianity is the great confession. Don't you understand that? Right. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this, that you've got to believe in your heart that Jesus died for you and God raised him from the dead to be saved. And for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Christianity is the great confession. You have to confess the word. Hebrews 4 says that Jesus Christ is the apostle and high priest of our confession. Amen. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said that if the, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart shall bring forth good things. How? But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three 23, that you have to believe it in your heart and say it with your mouth and you shall have whatsoever you say. Are you hearing me? And here, God is speaking to us, and he's saying, listen, let the redeemed of the Lord say it, declare it, speak it out, confess it, lay hold of it, claim it, make it a part of your daily life. Hallelujah. And begin to declare who you are in Christ. Begin to declare what you're going to do. You know, I always tell everybody, you know, sometimes they talk about, uh, you know, these defensive backs. And they say, oh, they're so mouthy. You know, these defensive backs, backs play football. They're so mouthy. What do you think about them, Pastor? No, I don't, I don't never say anything because I was a defensive back. And <laughs> <laughs> this didn't, this mouthy stuff didn't just start with his generation. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I talked some trash to the guys that I was defending quite a bit, you know. And, and so, but this is the thing. People say, well, isn't it wrong to talk like that? Not if you can back it up. It's not trash talking if you can back it up. <laughs> You're just telling the truth. Amen. And you see, some people say, well, all that confession stuff don't mean nothing. It don't work. Well, if you don't know what you're talking about, and if you don't believe in it, and if you don't act like it, and if you don't think you can stand and make it work. That's right. But whenever I was talking to a wide receiver, telling him I was going to take him down, don't you even think about trying to catch pass because, you know, you're up against the wrong place. I own this spot right here. You know, <laughs> and, I, and I'm talking this stuff. Well, when he came down the field and cut across, and I came across, and we used to do things back then you can't do now, but you know. <laughs> and you know, it's amazing because, you know, I didn't know all this stuff back then, but even back then, whenever I would hit somebody, some, they'd throw a pass against me, I would always hit him and yell real loud. Ah! The only said, Why'd you do that? Because I wanted him to know what's coming, because I've already told him on the line. Plus, if he ever did happen to beat me and have a step on me, I would scream anyway. A lot of times he'd look and drop the ball. Hallelujah. <laughs> so I confess when I had it and confess when I didn't have it. Amen. And you know that's biblical. You should be saying the word when it looks like it's working. You should be saying the word when it doesn't look like it's working. Why? Because it doesn't change the redemption of the Lord. The redemption of the Lord is yours all the time anyway. You should be walking in it, confessing it, declaring it, saying it's yours. Praise God. Letting the devil know you believe this stuff. That you've been delivered from his bondage and from his power. Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read to you out of the Amplified just to, to help us with our time here. But he says this, verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints, God's holy people in the light. Aren't you glad God has qualified us, made us able and fit to be able to partake of the good inheritance that he has for us? Somebody says, well, if I could just get good enough, you are good enough. If Jesus is your Lord, you've been redeemed and you are qualified to partake of all the good stuff that God has for you. Amen. It's already been laid up for you. It's there. You're qualified and fit to get it. Verse 13, the Father has delivered. Everybody say delivered. delivered. 
But he didn't just deliver us. The next word says, and drawn us to himself. I like that. God not only delivered us out of the control and the dominion of darkness, but he also drew us into himself. Redemption means you have been taken out from under the power of darkness and have been drawn unto God and placed under his authority. Amen. I've been taken out of darkness and brought into light. I've been taken from being an outcast who does not have a right to the promises of God to being brought into a redeemed child of God who has a right to partake of the blessings of heaven now. Well, how did that happen, Pastor? Well, look what he says here in, in verse 14. Who, in whom we have our redemption. Whoo, glory to God. What qualifies me to be a partaker of the inheritance? What qualifies me to be delivered from the power of darkness and conveyed over to the, the kingdom of the Son of God and live in the blessings of God and walk in my redemption? In whom we have redemption through his blood, which means the forgiveness of our sins. Glory to God. Look at that, folks. The reason I can stand with boldness and praise God and thank God because my God is a good God. Because even while we were as sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And God released his love for me. And God reached down through Christ Jesus and delivered me from the power of darkness and brought me over into the kingdom of God and drew me back into himself. And Jesus laid aside his eternal glory, came to this earth in the form of a man and came as our near kinsman and bought us back as a family member back to God and presented us to God and he qualified us through the blood that now we can partake of the inheritance and you and I can stand up with boldness and conviction not with a question coming out of our mouth not with hesitancy not with condemnation guilt insecurity inferiority or unworthiness but we can stand up now and say I am the redeemed of the Lord and I say so because I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and I am now set free and the devil does not have a right to put his hand on me he can't keep me bound he can't keep me defeated he can't keep me sick he can't keep me out of God's blessing he cannot keep me from doing what God called me to do he cannot get in my home and family and mess it up and keep it messed up he can't keep me in drugs he can't keep me in defeat he can't keep me outside of what God has for me I have been delivered from the power of the enemy his hand is broken off of my life You've got to believe that. You've got to say that. Let the redeemed of the Lord say these things. Somebody says, well, how can you get all of that? Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written in the scriptures, curses is everyone that hangs upon a tree. Jesus redeemed us from the curse. He didn't just redeem us from sin. He redeemed us from all of it. Did you hear me? Redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse was at least threefold, folks. It was spiritual death, separation from God. But aren't you glad the blood brings forgiveness of sins? The curse was sickness and disease. But aren't you glad by his stripes you were healed? The curse was poverty, lack, and want. But you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was very rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Hallelujah. And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Are you listening to me? See, the blessing of the Lord is now available to you and me. We're redeemed from these things. But let's, let's, let's just look at the very first part. See, I'm redeemed from the hand of the enemy. In Romans chapter 6, the apostle Paul is writing over there and he's talking about this new life that we're reaching out and being brought into in Christ. And in that sixth chapter, he talks about that, that Jesus Christ died. Well, then he tells us that we are to reckon ourselves a part of that, identify with that death. We died with Christ. And he says Jesus was buried and we were buried with Christ. And then he says, Jesus was raised up into a new life. And he says, if we died with Christ and we're buried with Christ, then glory to God, we are raised up with Christ. See, identify not with just his life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Identify with not just his cross on on Calvary when Easter rolls around. But identify with his resurrection and that he is alive, seated at the right hand of the Father, now interceding so you and I can live to the utmost of the blessings that he's provided for us. John writes in 1 John, and he says, as he is now, so are we in this world. In other words, we're one with the Lord now. And you know what he says in Romans 6, 14? Turn over and look at it real quick. Romans, the sixth chapter. I mean, I've been speaking to you what's in it, but let's just take a moment and look at at least this verse. 
Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. This is what he says. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. For sin shall not dominate your life. Now listen to me. The Bible teaches us whenever, you know, Abel and Cain, they, they, they were the, the first two sons. And, and, you know, and, 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 and so they're bringing their offerings to God. And you know the story. Abel, he brought God. And people said, well, one was a meat offering, one was a vegetable offering. And that's why God didn't appreciate it. No. One was the first fruits. Another one was just what he could gather up. Right. Study your Bible. Because God lays out, when he lays out the law later on, he lays out flower offerings and, and fruit offerings and vegetable offerings mean, and crop harvests and all this stuff. And he honors it. But the difference is one brought the first of his flock. The other one brought in some stuff. Abel honored God. Cain just did what he needed to do. And he got all upset because God respected the reverence that his brother gave him. And you go over Genesis, and, and Cain is mad enough to throw a fit. You know what God does? God comes down and says, listen to me. He said, sin is lying at the door waiting to take you down, but you can do something about it. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. When you walk out of this house, sin will be lying out there somewhere, crouching, waiting to take you down. But now you're the redeemed of the Lord. You can do something about it. Are you listening to me? You don't have to yield to it. Cain rose up and slew Abel. Remember that? Out of anger, out of bitterness, out of, out of, out of his life being crazy. Instead of dealing with the things that were attacking him and looking to God and asking God to help him, he yielded to the sin. But now you and I, we can deal with that sin because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And now sin no longer has the right to have dominion over you. What's that mean? It means you can walk away. Are you listening to me? Now, let me give you a little help here. Just because you look at the menu doesn't mean you have to pay for the food. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about this. The only thing you're going to pay for is what you actually eat. If you order it, you pay for it. The devil's going to offer you the menu. He's got a whole list of sins, juicy sins that you can have. Look at this. Look at this. You can have that. Why don't you? Mm -mm, this would be good. And see, and if you look at the menu, a lot of times here's what the devil does. Ah, you old sinner. You said you was righteous. And here you are looking at the menu. Well, just because I looked at the menu doesn't mean I'm going to order off of it. And when I look at the menu, I always look over to the side. That costs that much? Oh, my God. I am in the wrong place. <laughs> and you know what? That's how you ought to look at sin. Just don't look at the juicy menu over here. Go to the other side and look over here on the right side. Look at the cost. And look at the, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I am redeemed from that devil, and I am not going to go back and try. Uh -uh. No, no. That cost me too much. And Jesus is too good for me to turn around and do that. I ain't ordering that. I'm out of here. And you just walk away. Because, you see, the devil can offer you the menu, but he can't make you order. Are you hearing me? He can't make you get it. He can't make you do it. He doesn't have dominion over you any longer. Just turn around and walk out of there. Amen. How do you know to do that? Listen to God. I, 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 I tell you something. One time I was, I wanted a car. This car so bad I could taste it. I mean, and, and, and we, Barn and I were just newly married. And so we went down and, 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 and I was trying to get this car. And, and the guy comes out and says, well, you, you just don't have enough credit. But if you want to get somebody to sign for you, you know, we'll sell it to you. And my dad, you know, I thought, well, I could call dad. And dad, you know, he, he, he said, yeah, I'll come down and help you. 
And he actually came down. And all that morning, I would just, God, I just felt bad in my spirit. I don't want to do it. If I can't afford to get it on my own, I ain't going to put anybody else under that bondage. And so I just, God, I'm a faith man. I, I should be able to believe God. Even if I don't have Christ, I should be able to believe faith or something. And so God just kept dealing with me. And, but it's laying right there. The paperwork's laying right there. And the guy said, just sign here. My dad's sitting there beside me. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you sign it you out of my will. So I picked it up. <laughs> they thought I was real nearsighted. <laughs> you know. I said, well, Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I mean, God says, you're going to get up and walk out of here. I said, they'll think I'm a fool. He said, better to be a fool than be a fool. <laughs> so I pushed it back. And I said, you know what? I appreciate it. And I'm sorry I put you all through this. But, you know, I've decided I, I, I just don't think I need to get this car right now. And I got up and turned and walked off. You know, I didn't feel that stupid. And by the time I got back to my old car, I felt really good because you know what? The enemy had presented me a menu, but instead of going ahead and going by the pressure of having to cave in and do what everybody thought I should do, I got up and walked off and didn't have to explain myself to anybody. And two weeks later, I found another car that was better than that one, and they sold it to me. For less than what that one was going to be, for a lesser payment, God had a better deal. But the devil was offering me one that would put me in bondage, but I just decided to walk away from it until God gave me a good one. And all the side, on the inside, God was saying, don't do that. I got something for you. Don't do that. Listen to me, folks. You and I are the redeemed of the Lord, and we're supposed to act like it and say it and live that way. Amen? Sin is no longer to have rule and dominion over you. But Jesus didn't just forgive you of your sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says what? Therefore, if any person is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Then in verse 21, it says, For he has made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we could be made the righteousness of God. Are you hearing me? You're not just the redeemed and some old so-and-so. You are the redeemed of the Lord, a new creation in Christ, and made righteous with God. That's your redemption. You're not an old nobody. You've been made God's child. Are you hearing me? Look in Romans the 8th chapter. You're right there in Romans 6. Look over here. What do you mean being a, a new creation? Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. Ooh, glory to God. We just stop there and shout the rest of the evening. Amen? Amen? Now. Not when we get to heaven. Not in the sweet by and by. Right now. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who? Who? Who are in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man or woman is in Christ, he's a new creation. So if I get in Christ and I'm a new creation, I get delivered from condemnation, unworthiness, and all the other junk that comes along with that. Amen? Now listen to what he says. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, you're in Christ Jesus. Now you're supposed to live like it. Isn't that what David said in the 107th Psalm? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord thank God. Let the redeemed of the Lord live in victory. Let the redeemed of the Lord celebrate the goodness of God. Let the redeemed of the Lord enjoy the mercies of God. Let the redeemed of the Lord live and act and talk like the redeemed of the Lord. And David says that, and then Paul says, there's no condemnation or guilt, no, no, nothing that's going to bring you into bondage if you'll just walk in this. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Why? That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What's he saying? God's righteousness now comes into us because of what Jesus did for us. I have a right to approach God without a sense of guilt, condemnation, or inferiority. Why? Because I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. My near kinsman came back and bought me out of slavery and bondage and sin and brought me back and presented me to my father, not as an outcast, but as a child. And now there's no condemnation in my life. I'm walking in this. I'm declaring this. I'm speaking it out. Praise God. Now drop down to verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. God didn't get you out of bondage to get you into bondage. 
Did you hear me? God didn't redeem you out of bondage to put you back in bondage. Christianity isn't a religion. Christianity isn't a bunch of ordinances. Christianity isn't a bunch of do's and don'ts. Christianity is a relationship. It's, it's a walk with God. It's being delivered from the power and the authority of Satan and sin and darkness and the curse of the law and brought over to the blessing where God can bless you and take care of you and help you. And he says, you've not received the spirit of, of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children and heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Ooh, you didn't hear that last part. And joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And joint heirs, a joint heir. Equal heir. Ooh, you almost say that and you almost feel like you, you just need, oh God. That's what religion does to you. See, you say joint heirs and you almost feel like you blasphemed. You say, join heirs, y'all. Oh, you're elevating yourself up too high. No, I've got news for you. I, I'm not doing that. Ephesians 2 says that God raised me up and seated me in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It was God who elevated me up here. I didn't do it. I didn't have anything to do with this. I didn't redeem myself. The Lord redeemed me. The Lord qualified me. The Lord saved me. The Lord made me righteous. The Lord is good to me. The Lord is merciful to me. The Lord chose to put his blessing on me. The Lord made me an heir. The Lord made me a child the Lord put his spirit in me and the Lord leads me and he guides me he's doing this I'm just working with him hallelujah and to make it work you know what he says let the redeemed of the Lord say so just talk it and walk it and live it and watch God do mighty things in your life amen we're to give thanks and praise him and declare these things folks they won't work for you if you don't declare them you got to learn it, and then you got to say it, and then you got to do it. Your words should be pointing out in front of you the path that you're following. Amen. See, your, your, your words are what goes before you and, and, and brings out the blessing of God. When I was young, I, I, you know, we, 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 we hunted anything and everything. You know what I'm saying? We, my grandpa, we'd go up to my grandpa's house, and there'd be old shotguns sitting up. In a corner. They was all old up and good. I mean, 16 gauge, 12 gauge, 20 gauge, you know, whatever. And, and, and pump action, bolt action. And, and so from the time I was a little guy, 410s, 22s, I mean, you know, you start off with a 410 and work your way up. And we go out rabbit hunting. And we lived out in the country. And so there was always a couple of beagles running around. And they were always rabbit dogs. And rabbit season comes in. And when you go rabbit hunting, you know, you walk out. We had this one dog named Susie. And, and my dad would go out and he'd shuckle, you know, the old 12 gauge. And it didn't matter where she was. She could hear that. And you could hear her running. Arr, arr, I mean, that big old bark. And just, I mean, and here she comes and she's jumping and carrying on because she's ready to go hunting. And, you know, we'd go out and we'd go out in the woods and there'd be a bunch of us. And, and, and that big old, she'd be up about 20, 30 feet in front of us just working her way. And all of a sudden, she, she'd find a rabbit, she'd go on a trail, and if she jumped it, then if we didn't get a shot, then she'd just trail it back around to us. See, that, that big old in the natural would be like your confession, hallelujah. And when you open up your Bible, your confession should be going, whoa, yeah, we're ready to talk the word now, hallelujah. And then whenever you decide you're going to go after the blessing of God, you put your confession out in front of you, and your confession runs down that, that rabbit and jumps it out for you so you can get it, hallelujah. And if you keep confessing it, it'll bring it right around to you again. Because God gave you a confession and an action to release his redemption in your life. Amen? Last scripture. Once you see this, 1 Peter chapter 2. You need to get this one. Because this one ties in all of what we've been saying. 1 Peter chapter 2. Look down here in verse 9. Very familiar scripture, but we're going to read it with verse 10. Look what he says. Verse 9. Talking to the redeemed of the Lord. Believers. But you are a chosen generation. You ever think of yourself as a chosen generation? God chose you. You're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. How do you see yourself right now? Do you see, you see yourself as royalty? You should be because you're a royal priesthood. Let's read on. 
a holy nation. Do you see yourself as holy? God calls you holy. His own special people. Do you see yourself as special? See, the reason sin defeats a lot of people is they don't see themselves as special. They see themselves as worthless or whatever. But God sees you as special. God so loves you that he reached down and chose you when nobody else wanted you. He wanted you. God made you holy. And then God says, I'm going to make you a royal priest. I mean, that's one who gets to be with the king. Hallelujah. Then he says, his, his own special people. God's own special people. Now, what am I supposed to do with that, Lord? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I am to talk as a child of light. I am to praise God every day that I'm no longer under the authority of darkness. Jesus is my Lord. But now listen to this next verse. Remember, the Redeemer is one who is a near kinsman who redeems a family member out of bondage and brings them back to the family. Verse 10, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I was lost and in sin and bound and taken by the devil into his bondage. But Jesus, my near kinsman, came and paid a price and purchased my freedom and brought me back. And I wasn't a family member, but now I'm a family member. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was an outcast, but now I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with the very one that came and delivered me from that bondage. Now I'm special in the eyes of God. I'm chosen of God. I'm royal with God. And I'm a qualified partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. Why? Because my sins are now under the blood of Jesus Christ and I don't have any guilt, condemnation, inferiority I really believe I am everything I'm preaching to you right now <laughs> are you listening to me? And I don't, I, I'm not arrogant with that, I'm not boastful with that, I'm not conceited with that I'm just that, hallelujah yeah. amen we were playing golf one time. It's not in here on scene. But anyway, we were playing golf one time. And, and there was a circle out on the golf course out there. And, and, and so I said, I told him and Bert, I think, was there. And I said, I'm going to put one in that circle. And it's a few hundred yards away. You know, it's, it's all, we're driving. Par four. So they'll see it. Well, I, I said, Lord, help me here. You know, pray. Me. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I hit the best shot I've hit in my life. And I hit that thing. And you know that ball went just perfect, landed about 10 feet, and rolled right into that circle. It said, it ain't bragging if you do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you know something, folks? This ain't bragging. This is just declaring what Jesus did for us. If it's bragging, it's bragging on Jesus. And it's walking in the reality of it. It's time to lay hold of your redemption. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now and praise you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are all the Bible says you are. And you will do for us all the Bible says you'll do. And Lord, tonight, I thank you and praise you for working in our lives and bringing the revelation of redemption into us and, and revealing to us the, the good things that you have for us and the truth of this word. So that, Lord, we don't leave here bound, oppressed, or in bondage. We don't leave here condemned, and guilt-ridden with a spirit of unworthiness and uncleanness. But we leave here with no condemnation. We leave here washed in the blood, set free by the power of God. And Lord, we leave here declaring the devil has no right to put his hand upon our life because we belong to you. Now, Holy Spirit, just move in our midst. And Lord, touch every situation, touch every life. We thank you, Lord God, right now. Right now. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, each one of us searching our heart. I ask you this question tonight. Are you the redeemed of the Lord? Have you accepted your redemption? You don't have to earn it. You accept it. God qualified you to get it. And even while we were yet in sin, God commended his love toward us and that he sent his son. And Jesus Christ came and gave his life so that you could be brought back to God. So that you could be delivered from whatever it is that's holding you in bondage that you would have God working on your behalf if you're not the redeemed of the Lord that's the very first thing I want to do I want to pray with you tonight that you will receive Christ or maybe you've fallen away gotten mad blamed God devil got you deceived and you thought it was God doing it God didn't do it to you so, so you're deciding right now I'm, I'm going to 
I'm not going to blame God. I'm going to put the blame where it really belongs. That's the devil. And he's tried to sneak back in, put his hand on me. He has no right. I'm delivered from the hand of the enemy. And tonight, I need to rededicate my life to Christ. If that's you, I want you to do one simple thing. Be honest with yourself, honest with God. That's all God's looking for, an honest heart. Lift your hand up to heaven and say, Lord, I need you. Help me. I want to give my life to you. I want to give my heart back to you, Lord Jesus. Just lift your hand up. God bless you. Thank you. Tonight, Lord, I accept this. I'm going to receive my redemption. I'm going to walk in the light of it. I'm going to learn of the redemption that I have in Christ. I'm going to, I'm going to let it work in my life, Lord Jesus. I'm coming out of this thing. Anybody else? Hands are gone up. If you raise your hand, I want you to do something just real quick without even thinking about it. Just stand up right where you are. I'm going to stand up for Jesus right now. Come on. You lifted that hand. Stand. I'm standing up for the Lord. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Now, those that are standing, everybody look up. I want you, those that are standing, come on down here. Let's stand together. Amen. Can I take a stand with you? Come on over here. Come on, young lady. Step out. Step out. See, it's a walk of faith. It's taking a step of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Come on. So why do we have to come up here? Because, you see, Jesus wants us to take a stand openly. I'm not ashamed of this. Listen, I didn't preach this. In a, I didn't stand back in the back room and preach this over video because I didn't want to be in front of you while I was saying all this stuff. I preach this because I believe it. I live it. I work it. You understand? And let me tell you, tell you something, folks. When I said the enemy has a menu out here, and he'll, he'll offer you to look at the menu, he offers it to everybody. And just because you looked at it doesn't mean you sinned. It's when you order off of it. When the enemy offers you that, just lay it down and say, uh-uh, it costs too much. I'm in the wrong place. And walk away walk away everybody stand with me y'all ready to just make a stand for Jesus let's join hands up here jump right in here brother praise God amen you just just hold on to that and I'll, I'll put my hand right here let's we're gonna pray I want you to pray this just by your head just say this after me dear Lord Jesus I believe in my heart you are the son of God you died for my sins you was raised again for my salvation you redeem me from every sin from everything I thank you Lord and I believe in my heart and I receive you as my Lord and I confess before all Jesus Christ is my Lord I am the redeemed of the Lord and I say so thank you Lord for my full redemption I declare it mine now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Now, circle around. Circle around. Just, just put your hand on his shoulder there so he doesn't have... Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these to stand here. Lord God, we thank you tonight that they're redeemed. They're delivered. Now, devil, you take your hands off of their lives. We break every curse. We break every stronghold. We command every weight, every sin, everything that's hindered, every guilty thing, every unworthy thing, every unclean thing that the enemy would try to throw upon their minds, Lord. We thank you that you cleanse them and free them right now. Lord, I thank you. Your word says, Lord, that when you cleanse us and forgive us, you blot it out. and You no longer remember, so it's gone. And I thank you that this is a new day and a new season. And, Lord, they're leaving here tonight not bound. They're leaving here tonight delivered and made whole. And they are the redeemed. And we stand and celebrate with them tonight their full redemption in Christ. And we give you the praise and just undergird them and strengthen them with our faith and celebrate with all of heaven with them that they were lost, but now they're found. And they've come home, and we rejoice with them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Pastor John, there he is. Listen, we've got some literature we'd like to get to you. And just take a moment, if you would, and go with Pastor Joplin and some other of our prayer warriors. Amen. You want to go with them? Right back that way. Can you go that way? Amen. Praise God. Now then, hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a great praise again. Hallelujah.
Amen.